Welcome. I am Michael Gaucher, and I'm exploring software development in .NET on a low-end computer that is comprised of an Intel Pentium processor and four gigabytes of RAM. Data drives programs, and so I know there is a healthy bit of discussion in previous years on data structures and algorithms. Well, this is kind of tongue-in-cheek, but the actual description should say something data structures first and then algorithms and there are dissenting opinions on this like there are on many things in life and some people are the view whether explicitly overtly or implicitly that algorithms are the thing to focus on more but i'm more in the data camp actually i'm solidly in the data camp data determines functionality data determines how the computer is going to respond to you and how the computer is going to uh, work best for what you're trying to do. And when you work with data, shape it, organize it in certain ways, understand it, when is the right time for data to appear and exit certain sequences, you actually can do remarkable things with computers when you approach it that way, rather than fighting against the computer you can actually use the computer in a more a seamless and harmonious way when you come at it from a data uh, perspective, data orientation. And so this program that I'm writing began in Linux where I wrote a program to pull RSS feeds from the internet and show them on a screen so that it's a more time efficient way to deal with data and this is not a new process by any stretch of imagination. There are numerous RSS readers out there. I just couldn't find one on Linux at the time that I started this around five to seven years ago that um, I was comfortable with. And so I decided RSS, an RSS reader, in my opinion, yes, there are very complicated, complex ones out there. But I said, for what I want, a very straightforward, streamlined uh, version of an RSS reader is all I need. And so that's a short story on a longer story that I go into in my main introductory uh, video that I published on uh, July 26, 2022. And so that video goes into more detail at a mid-level about uh, what's going on with RSS and RSS readers. Here, we need to take RSS information or information derived from an RSS feed and incorporate it into, integrate it into an SQL-like database on Linux and use that data file to extract out that information, transform it in the .NET program using C-sharp and load it into an SQL database. You see what I did there? I actually used an acronym before introducing it. Uh, ETL, extract, transform, and load is the process, it's the way of describing the process of moving data from where it is to where you want it to be. And when you get it in that uh, destination format, you do or you do not transform it. You know, maybe you want it to be in a different format. Maybe you want uh, certain uh, parts of the data to be changed or you want to exclude certain pieces of information and you want to use certain pieces of information to create new pieces of information but in the same format there's all kinds of ways you can go about this but in a simpler way here we're going to take data out of an SQL SQL like database and we're going to put that data in an SQL server database okay so the tables that we have in SQLite, we're going to take the information out of there and we're going to put it in tables in an SQL server database. And SQLite does work on Microsoft Windows 100%. Firefox and Chrome both use SQLite to store your information in those web browsers. And so I could use SQLite straight out the gate, but Part of my focus here is that since I'm on Windows 11, Microsoft Windows 11, 
I want to use Microsoft tools all the way, right, in, in this environment. So in the Linux environment, I'm using tools that are renowned in that environment. And in this environment, Microsoft Windows 11, I decided I wanted a complete Microsoft experience. And so I'm going to use Microsoft Visual Studio, right? I'm going to use Microsoft C Sharp, and I'm using Microsoft SQL Server to do the data portion of this overall process, right? And so this also gives me the opportunity to see what does SQL Server look like on a low-end computer. And in my earlier video series, Intel and Intel Pentium and SQL Server, I showed what that looked like from the standpoint of setting up SQL Server and just running it. Just Let's just run SQL Server. Let's just see what that looks like. But that's totally different from when you have to use and depend on SQL Server as we're going to do here. So before we get into this RSS Reader program, what we first got to do is ETL. And to accomplish ETL here, because I didn't find a SSIS package for transforming SQLite from SQL Server from SQLite to SQL Server. I looked at that first because again, I'm familiar with many of the Microsoft tools and I, I really like SSIS. Um, I, I like using that in a professional environment. But I didn't see any uh, adapters for, uh, for SQLite. And I could have created one, but that would have been a much longer video. And so I decided that I'm going to create a data conversion um, by building a program to do that. In the first video, we began in Linux. And in the Linux environment, there were RSS databases that were SQLite databases that kept RSS data. And we copied those databases to a flash drive so that we could have them on Windows for the purposes of converting the data in those SQLite databases to SQL Server. I have uh, the two database files here. I put them into separate folders so that um, initially we could know what was the dates uh, for these files. The first hurdle we have is how do we convert data that's in SQLite to SQL Server? Well, in this day and time we have Google and we can search for um, the relevant answer for that and in this case um, I took a shortcut which namely is my experience and I looked for a .NET data provider for uh, SQLite and I found a great example from none other than Microsoft themselves. They have a code snippet here that's ready to go that shows an example of how you would read data, read, not change, but read data out of an SQLite database. And so I'm going to re refer to this code example because I can read C Sharp and read .NET code very fluently and this one snippet of code tells me everything I need to know. And so I'm going to create a, a project in Visual Studio. In the earlier videos we created a WPF project for our user interface. Well this time we're going to create a console project more generally known in the industry as a command line program. And so I'm going to create this command line program and what it does is it um, allows us to focus just on the code. You know, when you're building command line programs, there are no frills, there are no bells and whistles, there's no fluff and boilerplate. It is just raw code and the, when you run that command line program, that code is just going to execute right and that's what I want I want to just focus on the the pure code that deals with data in this instance and so the console application will allow me to do that this um, application I will also manage through github 
And I do want to make sure we adhere to the naming conventions established in the earlier video, right? Where we have a multi dotted namespace, right? And so um, this will be called um, gaucher.rss.reader um, convert to SQL Server, SQL Lite to SQL Server, right? And so um, it's going to have a name uh, sort of like that. And I'm going to use um, NuGet, right? NuGet is going to allow us to add the appropriate references to this project. And in this case, we want the Microsoft.SQLLite.Data.Core um, package. And so we're going to search for that. Um, there are a couple of tabs here in the NuGet window. We want to browse. And so we've already typed in our search term, which is SQLLite. And it will bring back all the packages that... Um, you know, refer to SQL light in some form or fashion. And here we see Microsoft.data.sqlite.core. And so that's the central package that we will use. And that is going to get us started with writing code for um, SQL light in the .NET um, arena. And more specifically, not only will this allow us to compile the program so that it can access SQLite properly, but it will help us with IntelliSense to the extent that we need it. In this case, we don't really need IntelliSense. We can write this code just straight out. But it's always helpful to have a visual reminder that you're on the right track in terms of your code. So these databases that were copied over from Linux were put into the downloads folder, right? And so I'm going to open up a terminal, a command line a window, and I want to inquire into these databases. And um, the main objective here is to see that one, SQLite does work on Microsoft Windows, and number two, that um, the data was transferred over to Windows intact and that there was no data file corruption, there were no issues, right? I'm also going to uh, copy these databases. Keep in mind there was one database per folder, one for 2020 and one for 2022. And I'm going to copy those files into a single folder called RSS underscore DB. And so now that I have the two files in this folder, it will be very easy for a program to simply um, iterate through the files to enumerate the files and allow us to um, query the files appropriately. And so... Um, I've downloaded SQLite tools from the SQLite Projects website. They made a SQL, SQLite version for Windows, a, a command line tool that, you know, if you wanted to go to the administrative uh, step of adding it to the system path, then from any command prompt you can simply type SQLite 3 and run it. But I decided to, to not do all of that and just run it directly uh, from the folder it's downloaded or extracted into. And so I do dot system and then CLS so that I can pass the CLS command to the command prompt uh, through SQLite and clear, clear the screen. And then I run dot table so I can see the list of tables. And then I'm going to do dot schema feeds and dot schema feeds articles so that I can see the uh, table layouts for those particular uh, tables. This, uh, th this output I can leave open for the entire entirety of this data uh, conversion process. This is going to show the column definitions for each of the tables, in this case the two tables, that um, retains the data that we want to migrate from SQL Lite to SQL Server. And so here 
we're going to start the coding sequence to get us started we're going to use the simplified uh, command line uh, uh, structure in the uh, latest versions of .NET where you don't need to declare a program class, you don't need a main method, you don't need any of that. Um, I believe Microsoft.NET team calls this um, a program without ceremony or uh, reduced ceremony. And so um, I'm okay with reduced ceremony, but as you will see later on, there is a benefit still today for having more of the ceremonial aspects or having the, the more of the traditional structures for defining the entry point for the program. But here we're going to continue without an entry point, and um, where our first objective is to access the file system and get the list of database files so that we can pass each database file to the Microsoft ADO.NET uh, provider for uh, SQLite so that the data can then be extracted through the ADO.NET uh, API, in this case the uh, implementation for SQLite, so that that data can then be materialized into collections um, that we can use as intermediate data stores in memory to induce that into um, SQL Server. And so, um, more to that point, I'm going to create a settings file. I prefer settings files. My mind can be changed on that but I find them rather convenient and expedient in the .NET, um, .NET world. And so I'm going to create a settings file that will contain the connection string. And for certain types of applications, and this is uh, definitely one of those types at this stage, um, a settings file where we have a connection string is, is uh, entirely appropriate. But in an enterprise setting, you would use uh, another construct you might have um, encrypted connect connection strings, database connection strings, because database connection strings in uh, enterprise applications oftentimes uh, consist of a username and password as part of the uh, invocation protocol to access a database. But if you're using Kerberos and you're using um, you know, a form of Windows authentication and service uh, identities attached to Windows services and all of that, or in task scheduler, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you can uh, get around these types of issues. But in this particular example, um, this allows us to avoid uh, setting up extensive infrastructure just for the purposes of utilizing a connection string to a local database. So we have all of the table column names here. I'm going to copy it and paste it as is directly into. Uh, from the command line window into the text editor and Visual Studio. And then I'm just going to do a text replacement at some point uh, to transform them into class, pro class properties, class fields. Um, but here I want to do a select statement using these same column names. And at first I thought I would have a, a column per line, but I decided I just wanted to have all the columns listed out on a single line. Then I thought about that and I was like, that's not really my style and I don't like that. And I'm going to do something just slightly more clever but also more maintainable and easier to tweak. And I'm going to put the column names into a collection, a glorified array. And then I'm going to um, use the join method. I'd, I'd rather use the word function, but I'm going to use the join method on the string type, right? The static join method. And I'm going to use that to um, automate the concatenation of the collection values um, into a common delimited list that will um, merge into a interpolated string. And then this way I will have a query a string, an, a, a, a SQL server select statement query string that would uh, essentially have all the column names that I'd need. But then if I never, if I ever need to change the column names or co uh, the sequence of the columns, then I can do that from a central location rather than having to chase down every instance where I refer to those those column names, those column values, right? 
I'm sorry, the column names. And so um, here I am trying to build the program. I'm running into an issue. Um, it appears that the type of command line project that I set up does not understand the settings file, right? We're going to overlook that for now. I'm going to correct that later. But let's add a data class, and I'm going to call this class feeds, right? Now, um, I'd already uh, told Visual Studio to create class one. If I rename class one to feeds, it will also rename the actual class declaration in the uh, corresponding file and do that automatically. Uh, that's, that feature has been around for many versions of Visual Studio and it's extremely convenient. So there's never an excuse um, for having um, a mismatch between the class name and the file that it's in. And of course that pre predates uh, Microsoft Visual Studio. Um, that's from the Java realm. Um, Microsoft, in the Microsoft world, that is not, um, um, that's not enforced, right? But these automations here allow us to maintain parity without having to think about it. And so um, I did text replacement there using, um, you know, find and replace. And I took that string that I copied and pasted, took all the double quotes and, you know, um, and the commas. And, you know, I started there and automated the, uh, in the injection of uh, get and set accessors, right? Uh, setters, uh, getters and setters, uh, automa automatic properties, and then I automated the um, field access modifiers and the uh, data type for these fields since they're all the same. And so it took uh, a quick second to do that and reduced the typing. And then I'm going to set the default value uh, for the um, generated properties to an empty string. And here um, I generated a class, but I went ahead and declared up front um, in a creation of the class what the actual name should be, right? So uh, once again, I'm going to uh, automate the translation of the text, and that's going to speed things up a little bit. I apply the same text modifications as before, as I did with the feeds class, right? And so this is a very quick and um, productive way to work with classes and class definitions when writing code in any language. And so there's no difference here. Once I have that class in place, those classes in place, then I can construct more relevant codes for the conversion of data from SQL Lite to SQL Server. And here I use refactoring um, mechanisms in Visual Studio. You just press Control uh, dot, and it will bring up um, a variety of context-sensitive uh, operations. And I chose uh, to refactor a block of code to extract it into a function. And so that's a quick way to um, break up your, your code into uh, definable chunks, into definable sections that can be referred to by name right and I'm going to continue to um, translate the code into uh, a variety of functions right extract a method extract them into functions and then with that um, I have the code nicely organized for what I need to do and so this is the point where um, I took a, a good 20 to 30 minutes and I uh, converted the project, the command line project, uh, over to um, a different format so that um, I could use the, um, the ceremony um, that we had dispensed with earlier. And that um, allowed the use of the settings files, right? That allowed us to use the settings file uh, more productively. There were other ways to work around that, but I decided to go that route since um, you know, that was a much cleaner way to do that. And I found that when running the program with the Microsoft um, .data .sqlite core, um, it did not run um, entirely successfully uh, despite what the indications were from several web articles. So I did uh, quite a bit of research and I found that there was another package that you needed in order to 
um, get things to run uh, properly. And that was the, um, the Win Bundles package for SQL Lite. And so um, here I am setting up the settings file with the connection string. So I generated a new settings uh, file in this revised project. And so I'm going to have the, um, the connection string set to the proper directory path. And that is going to um, allow us to access the database files where they reside on the computer. But there's just one error with this um, connection string. And it turns out that um, when I was forming, forming the path, right, um, it was using my name without a space in between. Whereas in Windows, even though my username might be Michael Gaucher, all one word with no spaces, um, the actual name is Michael Gaucher, two words. And in the user's uh, path, right, um, it's Michael space Gaucher. And that one little letter, right, uh, made a huge difference. And so I fixed that, and that got things uh, where they needed to be. And so here, with these breakpoints, these debugger breakpoints, this will allow me to inspect the code as it's running at various points to see how well things are running. And so let's uh, start this. And so Visual Studio has, has invoked the command line version of the program. And we can uh, see that the directory, directory was not found. And so that's where we needed to um, add that space between Michael and Gaucher so that it matches what's actually on the file system, which is Michael space Gaucher. And then with that tweak made, we're able to go in there and uh, run the program successfully. So uh, go into the settings file, put that space there, and we'll have success. Then the other part of this is uh, once we get further down to the point where, um, you know, we get past the point where we um, actually have the files, the file names, right? So that part um, is running successfully um, at this point. Right. Um, that's why we are now on line 23. Um, when we actually try to extract the data, we run into some problems. And so that's where um, it becomes important to do the research. Um, we end up with a type initialization exception. That is a long way of saying um, that the actual data type that the .NET data provider um, needs is not there and so um, and to be a little bit more clear the actual SQL light code from the SQL light project is being used this is not code that's written by Microsoft Microsoft wrote the high-level layer but that high-level layer is just that um, you still need the actual SQL light code you know, similar to the codes that you have on Linux. And the SQLite team has written those codes and provided the appropriate wrappers for them to integrate with Windows. And that is not installed with the, the first uh, NuGet package that we installed. So I went through various websites and I found, I went through various forums. Um, it took um, a good minute to um, piece together what was missing. But once I uh, found out what that was and um, made a judgment on that, because there were conflicting uh, recommendations. There, was, there were quite a few conflicting recommendations. So I drew on my experience and my insight about um, the way this process would work uh, to you know, zero in on what the, the right uh, answer is from the various answers that were given. And so I decided to go with the when SQLite bundle, um, Win SQLite 3. So that first option that you see, you see two options, right? Um, you see two options there, and it can be a little bit confusing, but one says, um, you know, uh, portable libraries, and so I'm not using the Microsoft uh, 
uh, portable libraries uh, te technology in .NET. I'm just using uh, straight .NET, and so that's why that first option is the relevant one for this uh, this situation. And so um, I chose that option and integrated that into the project through NuGet, and so I have the right references. I want to uh, run the clean command so that we can get rid of uh, any uh, now uh, orphaned uh, references, right? Uh, from our previous um, experiments. And so now we have the correct dependencies and the program runs the way that we expect up to this point. And this will allow us to um, essentially inspect the data in the debugger, right, through the collections. And so um, I see that um, I needed an S on feed, right, so that the query runs correctly because the table is feeds article, right? Feeds article. And so um, I made that one little modification and the program runs successfully. You see that we're now on line 52, uh, which is the end of the main function. And from that vantage point, depending on how I have my types declared, I can now um, hover my mouse over the variables representing the uh, the data collections, and I can use uh, you know that that visual representation to see um, how the information was constructed. I'm going to override the to string method that is inherited from the object class, and I'm going to use that to um, to make the visualization of the data in the debugger more useful.